All right, great um, introduction to uh, what's becoming a really um, uh, good news, bad news, but, hope, but mostly ending up with good news story with the immunotherapy um, in cancer. And uh, just as an aside, it's fun for me to be in an immunotherapy uh, session again because as a postdoc, I took a, a bit of a detour from my immunology training and I was told uh, when I went to a steroid hormone receptor lab that I would never be taken seriously as an immunologist, so haha, -ha, I'm back. <laughs> I'm in immunotherapy again. All right, so I'm going to talk today about um, some of the efforts that we uh, have um, uh, in my lab uh, and my role in uh, also groups and teams that are involved in uh, looking at immunotherapies at UCSD Morse Cancer Center for prostate cancer. Um, so prostate cancer, um, some of you may or, or may not know, is a uh, one in six men will um, get prostate cancer in their lives and it's currently the second leading cause of cancer death in men over uh, 50 years old. And while the majority of Sorry, my finger is a little clammy. Um, <laughs> while the majority of prostate cancer patients um, have a good prognosis, it's, you know, the slow uh, disease, there is this significant um, group um, where the disease progression uh, is very profound. Um, and in these advanced uh, prostate cancer patients, they typically get treated after surgery, radiation, et cetera, uh, with um, androgen deprivation therapy. And uh, the blood marker, which is a, a, a good thing in prostate, um, unique for um, cancers, is PSA. And the goal of the therapy is to monitor and keep that level low. Once it increases in the face of androgen deprivation or ADT therapy, it's called castrate-resistant prostate cancer, which is a rather uh, brutal term, but it's supposed to be uh, less uh, mechanistically um, more open. Um, to cover more mechanisms for which this resistance can occur. Um, and then another uh, terrible fact about prostate cancer is that it's one of those uh, subsets of cancers like uh, along with breast, lung, uh, kidney, um, sometimes bladder, that preferentially metastasize to bone. Uh, and this leads to a lot of um, terrible uh, sequelae uh, that need to be treated um, significantly and also untreatable bone pain. Um, so What's uh, the uh, current stages of immunotherapy in prostate cancer? So prostate cancer initially had this, you know, it was like the poster child for immunotherapy, where um, the very first dendritic cell immunotherapy was approved by the FDA, which um, uh, was the Provenge Cipulose LT. And then along came checkpoint inhibitors, which have been phenomenally successful for um, melanoma and in some um, lung cancers. Um, however, uh, prostate cancer is one of those uh, immunologically um, um, poor uh, cancers, um, cool, not hot, that's what they call it, cold tumors. Uh, and so these monotherapies of these um, great um, checkpoint inhibitors, um, anti-CTLA4, anti-PD-1, uh, were really ineffective and that was a big disappointment. Now there's um, trials with combination therapy uh, which um, are looking much more promising. However, there's still a lot to find out. Why are these tumors not responsive to uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors? What makes them cold? How can we you know, energize them and, and uh, get more uh, of an immune response in there? And of course, there's the uh, CAR T-cell therapy, which you'll hear um, more about uh, later um, from uh, one of the leaders, of course, in the field is Dr. June. Um, so today I'm going to cover three top or two topics and just mention this last one. Uh, one I'm going to talk about a uh, very interesting collaboration that we have with a local um, uh, research institute um, called Caliber, for, um, uh, which is uh, one of uh, Dr. Peter Schultz's uh, main efforts uh, and the team, this collaboration with Travis Young. And we've uh, got models, we've developed models to test um, one of their um, by specific um, molecules that targets prostate cancers and drags the activated T cells over to the tumor. Um, I'll also talk uh, about uh, Protux clinical trial, which is a neoadjuvant treatment with rituximab, and you say, what? Um, but I'll convince you that it's actually um, perhaps quite a, a different way to, to uh, attack and uh, make these tumors, again, more immunogenic. 
Um, and then uh, I won't be able to talk about the prospect trial, but it's really getting at the question of what can we do uh, in the prevention sphere, which is really uh, a trial of an anti-PSA vaccine in active surveillance patients. And um, that's in part, we've actually completely accrued the trial and we've collected the peripheral blood lymphocytes to look at evaluating the immune response and then also to um, sequence the T cell receptor and B cell receptors to do precisely what um, you mentioned before about these uh, T cell receptor uh, CAR T cells where we identify what are the responsing. So, okay, so first I'm going to talk about um, our uh, PDX models uh, for bone metastatic prostate cancer, so patient derived xenograph models. So, as I mentioned, uh, prostate cancer uh, goes to the bone uh, where it um, becomes, it causes a lot of uh, bone damage as it grows. Um, which leads to intractable pain uh, and pathologic fractures. Um, and currently there's no cure. Once it's metastasized to bone, it's, you know, you're um, fighting the battle to keep uh, survival until the, the next um, therapy comes along. Um, and so what do they look like? So th this is some of the x-rays of the damage. Sorry, I'm pointing at my own screen. Um, <laughs> and so, um, oh, thanks. That's great. Okay. All right, so you get um, damage uh, to the bone, spinal cord compression, fractures. Um, and what do they actually look like? This is cross-section through the pelvis of patients who have um, the, the bone uh, CT showing the uh, pure uh, kind of bone overgrowth, very dense bone, osteoblastic kind of lesion, the, the holes in the bone that the tumors can cause, or a mixed uh, of both. And there's you know, six degrees of mixtures. Um, and then if you look at uh, the metabolic activity, you can see that there's a large mass here uh, that's very, very active. And then here there's an FD uh, PET looking at the binding of DHT, dihydrotestosterone. So this is um, a set of tumors in the bone uh, from a patient um, who uh, is resistant to the therapy, so they're progressing, but their, their tumor still binds the hormone. Um, whereas in this patient, their tumor has become very large, but their tumor no longer binds the hormone. So the point of this slide is just to show that even within one patient, you have a full range of different um, types of uh, behaviors of these metastases. And so it's a very complex uh, environment and question. And so how do we um, begin to understand what's the best combination therapy when, you know, there's all these different types of um, uh, tumorous uh, situations going on. And so to do this, we've um, developed, we uh, sought to develop new uh, patient-derived xenograft models. There's um, a dearth of models in prostate cancer. For some reason, it seems to be uh, uh, problematic to establish these, but not for lack of trying. Um, and um, another reason to develop the human models is that um, unusually, although uh, there's a lot of really great prostate cancer models in uh, genetically engineered mouse models. Um, metastasis to bone in those models, which is very common in humans, is very rare. So we have to, um, you know, rely on other ways to look at this problem. So here, so is an example of a femur, um, which is uh, from um, the orthopedic surgeon with whom I collaborate, Dr. Anna Kalugian. And just showing that this, uh, so she actually, uh, this poor gentleman had a fracture. So here's the fracture site. And Dr. Kalugian removed the femur head, uh, fem just plucked it out, and um, then sawed his femur longitudinally so that we could get access to these uh, bone lesions. And you know, this just shows you the dedication. Um, and this is why, you know, one of the you know, real uh, reasons for our success in generating these models is that Dr. Kalugian has been an absolute phenomenal uh, dedicated collaborator for us to be able to get these samples. And she was concerned that we wouldn't be able to get this one because it was within the, the femur. So she longitudinally saw, it took her half an hour with her orthopedic, you know, saws and everything. So anyway, um, but that's what the bone uh, metastases look like in situ. Um, so we take these samples, and this is an x-ray from our first patient, and uh, we've uh, 
that Dr. Kalugian um, had, had to do a pathologic fracture repair. He had a hairline fracture in his right femur, and she does a, a hip uh, hemiarthroplasty, half hip replacement. Um, and at the time, she removes all this tissue, and so we, you know, get the tissue and do everything that we can possibly think of to do with it. So we do, you know, prepare for genomic, transcriptomic, et cetera, analysis, inject it into immunodeficient mice to uh, try to develop new patient-derived xenograft models, and then um, we've developed some in vitro um, assays that we can use the cells with as well. So um, the first one, which, and we called our series Prostate Cancer San Diego PCSD, and the first one, PCSD1, was, you know, a home run, and it was, it's still our best one. We've got now up to 20 patient samples um, that um, were at various stages, and we've developed four um, pretty good serially transplantable uh, patient-derived xenograft models from these. You can see that when we do micro-CT scanning of uh, the, when this uh, tumor grows in the bone, it also produced, um, this is the injected femur, uh, in the mouse, it also produced a, uh, this, a very similar type of uh, bone reaction, which is a mixed osteolytic and osteoblastic. Here's that lytic um, showing the lacy end where the bone, uh, the prostate uh, cancer is uh, going out of the bone. So from this patient, um, so just to show you some evidence that um, the uh, tumor not only produces similar bone reaction, but it also uh, produces uh, at the genomic and transcriptomic um, level uh, very similar um, and almost identical uh, um, features as the original patient sample. So from this patient, we took his uh, femur, femoral bone metastasis and it transplanted it into the mouse femur interfemorally into the endosteal uh, bone marrow space and we serially transplant. But at every stage when we collect the tumor, and this is very important, we viably cryopreserve the cells so that not only do we, you know, flash freeze, put the cells, but we also have these viably cryopreserved um, tissues and cells that we can um, use for uh, future analysis and, and to maintain the low passage and at every single, we have liquid nitrogen tank full of every single passage of all our uh, samples. So. Um, a lot of work, but uh, and very much worth it. And so from this same patient, we also received subsequent uh, bone metastases, which we've been analyzing. And this is just to show one aspect of the analysis where we looked at the copy number variation, and this was with an OncoScan analysis. We've also done uh, whole exome sequencing analysis and um, whole transcriptome analysis using the uh, Affmetrix microarray. And the bottom line here is just to show you that um, if we're looking at percent change over the whole genome of copy number, um, so if we're going from chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to Y, um, these tracks are in um, triplicates. So the first are uh, blood, hysterm line, so we expect no change compared to normal diploid control. But if you look here, um, what was really surprising, not just to me, but to all the bioinformaticists who have looked at this, is that the patient bone met and our xenograft have like 80% of the genome is amplified. Um, and uh, in, in this uh, very uh, surprising, and it's maintained in the xenograft, and then there's subpopulations uh, in subsequent patient and in our higher passage xenografts um, that also maintain a lot of, uh, pretty much all the same changes. So the, the bottom line of this slide is just to show you that uh, for the purpose of this talk, our xenograft is um, very closely replicating the patient's disease. Um, and so um, we have uh, now up to 20 of these patient samples. Several of them have given us xenografts, and we've um, uh, really uh, started a single sequence, single cell sequencing approach to because it's a big mix of cells. So we have the micro environment cells, we have the lymphoid cells, we've got the bone marrow stromal cells, and we've got the patient tumor cells on them in this big mix of cells. So, um, and we've also tested a lot of the standard of care therapies, including um, uh, the antiandrogens, and found that they produce the same response as the patient was showing. So uh, we believe that it's a very good model that closely re recapitulates this uh, castrate-resistant behavior that's bone niche specific. So the, cat, the, the tumors actually respond to antiandrogens when they're not in the bone, but when they're in the bone environment, they're resistant. So we used our model with PCSD1 to test this novel idea for an immunotherapy um, that was developed at Caliber. 
Um, and it, I've worked with the two team leaders, Jen Hewitt Kim and Travis Young. And this is uh, an interesting, um, it's a small molecule uh, antibody conjugate. And so the small molecule binds specifically to this protein called PSMA. And PSMA, uh, prostate specific membrane antigen, um, its gene name is actually folate 1, it's folate hydrolase. Um, is this, has very low expression on normal prostate epithelium, but it's highly expressed on the vast majority of prostate cancer. So it's a really good uh, target, and it's being used successfully um, for PET and imaging. Um, in fact, some people are saying we should just use PET, but I know that not all uh, prostate cancers uh, high, have PSMA. Um, it's being used uh, for PET-CT guided radiotherapy. It's also being used uh, for actually antibodies labeled against PSMA to actually carry radio ligands as a um, radio ligand for theranostics. Um, and it's also being used in clinical trials as an antibody uh, drug targeted and also as, you know, I'm talking about today for CAR T cell tar um, therapies. And so the basic thing is that um, you have this bispecific uh, small molecule um, which has um, FAB fragments that bind CD3 and um, attract over the T cell. And then um, this uh, DUPA, which is a small molecule that binds to uh, the PSMA, it's got a long name, but I'm not going to say it. Um, and the publication is up here. Uh, and so the, by proximity, you get this bystander killing of the CTL uh, killing the, the tumor cells. So um, they, uh, Chen Hyuk approached me and asked me to be part of a grant, and I said, sure. And he said, okay, it's due in two days. And I said, okay. <laughs> and we, we wrote it, and we got it from the DOD. So that was really a, a great launching pad. Um, and so uh, they had tested it with a prostate cancer cell line called LNCAP, but he really wanted to, uh, he'd seen our models, and so uh, we looked at PSMA levels, and I knew from facts profiling that uh, PSMA was expressed on PCSD1. They did, uh, Travis's group has done a much more extensive and quantitative analysis, and it's got similar levels to LNCAP, so it's a good, um, should be a good um, way to target these cells. And so this is um, the uh, tumor growth uh, plot um, of uh, subcutaneous tumors that we injected with that should say PCSD1. <laughs> um, and so here's a saline treated individual mice. The tumors uh, grow very rapidly. Here are mice where we, so the, the, sorry, the experiment is to um, take activated donor T cells. So they're activated ex vivo with anti CD3, anti CD28 on beads. We inject them into the mice and then the following day uh, inject with the uh, conjugate. And so uh, what we, when we looked at act, uh, injection with the T cells alone, there was no uh, diminution of the uh, tumor growth, but the growth, so these are established tumors, um, subcutaneously, uh, they all shrank uh, when we treated with the uh, uh, DUPA um, CD3 uh, uh, conjugate. Uh, two of the mice started to regrow, and so uh, we retreated, and the tumors uh, regressed again. So it looked pretty good. Um, and this just to show you um, IVIS, uh, the bioluminescence, you could see that the saline or the PBS had, the majority of the mice had very large tumors, whereas the mice that were being treated um, with the T cells plus the bispecific small molecule inhibitor um, showed a, a great response. And so then we next wanted to test really the higher bar, which is the growth of the uh, PDX tumors in the bone which has been very resistant to many therapies um, that we've tested. And so what we found to, um, to our you know, uh, relief um, was that these tumors in the bone uh, also responded. And so you can see that at 14 days uh, post starting the treatment, we could see a great uh, reduction in the tumor cell growth. A waterfall plot of the percent change from the starting tumor showed uh, saline, antibody alone, T cells alone, yeah, um, and the combination uh, really wiped out the tumors. And so looking at, so that was IVIS for the, but if we look at the caliper measurement of the tumor volume as it grows out of the bone, um, we can really see that the treatment the, of the antibody plus the activated t human T cells 
um, got rid of this human uh, prostate cancer growing in the bone um, very, very effectively. Again, we saw a, regression, a recurrence in, a slight recurrence in two of the mice. We retreated the whole group and it uh, regressed once again. Um, looking at the T cell populations in the periphery, um, we could see that there was, uh, you know, good uh, CD3 positive and then both CD4 and CD8 positive. There were more in the peripheral blood of the T cells alone, uh, whereas the ones that had the T cells plus the antibody, there was a reduction in the peripheral blood and we surmised that and are looking now that most of these T cells have gone to the tumor. And so we have the dissociated um, cells to look at the tumor infiltrating um, uh, and we can do the immunoprofiling of the actual tumor infiltrating uh, cells. Um, so we have additional models, as I mentioned, PCSD1, PCSD5 are both very high PSMA. PCSD13 is a different beast altogether and it's PSMA negative. And so um, we would like to test this therapy, but also develop additional therapies for uh, these other aggressive tumors. So in summary, um, in our, uh, our uh, we tested this uh, great um, kind of redirecting uh, therapy where um, you can take the small molecule uh, antibody um, conjugate, so the small molecule is to bind to the tumor cell PSMA, um, and the uh, CD3 binds to the activated human T cells, and we get durable regression of castrate resistant prostate cancer in the bone. Um, and then retreatment was able to shrink the tumors in some of the mice. And it was interesting because some of these mice that had this recurrence had actually the lowest levels of circulating peripheral T cells, so I think they just need to expand further. Uh, further drug development has gone on and it's now fully humanized and the, the um, primate studies have been completed and successfully. And so now um, they're in talks to um, to uh, put this into the GMP facility so that it can go into uh, clinical trials, hopefully within a year. So um, now I'm going to talk about a, a take a, a, a shift in gears and talk about a different uh, mechanism that also came from um, really uh, primary um, and work from uh, Michael Karen's lab, in where they really wanted to look at. Um, cancer recurrence, and um, what they found was that there is this immunosuppressive B cell. Uh, and so um, they've uh, looked at different mechanisms for where it's uh, B cells that are actually suppressing activated uh, T cells, suppressing the activation of T cells in the prostate. Um, they've also shown it in um, liver. Uh, but this is a mechanism for um, uh, inhibiting the immune response to the prostate cancer, um, and uh, this has uh, been um, published. And uh, Dr. Karen, uh, Michael thinks that um, the primary source of PDL1 uh, in the prostate is actually these immunosuppressive B cells. So um, we, so this was done in mouse, and we actually collaborated with uh, Michael, Dr. Karen and then the urologist, Dr. Kane, to see uh, from primary prostatectomy tissue, do these cells exist in prostate uh, cancer itself and in humans, and it does. Um, and so, um, for example, and, so, and here's the uh, data from um, a paper, uh, Chalapur et al, um, showing these immunosuppressive B cells, and this was um, one of the um, primary data to show it. So the, here they have, they're comparing the, um, effectiveness of a low dose of oxaliplatin against uh, prostate cancer. This is a mouse prostate cancer, uh, so it's an immunocompetent mouse. And um, it's in uh, a low dose of oxaliplatin was completely ineffective, except if you specifically knock out the B cells. So JH, uh, uh, heavy chain knockout, specifically knocks out B cells. And suddenly these mice, the tumors were um, completely inhibited. Uh, this is a very aggressive tumor. Um, by this low dose of oxaliplatin. And so uh, there was a lot of reasons then to really look at um, in patients, uh, how can we manipulate this B cell population um, and will it make a difference? So that's uh, a big question, um, but it turns out that there's a great antibody, again, that ablates B cells. 
um, and it's been mentioned earlier today, and it's rituximab by one of the patients, in fact. Um, and so we wondered if, and um, Scott was uh, really instrumental in getting this um, trial going by flying, I think, uh, at the last minute up to Genentech to absolutely convince them that we had to do this. Um, so thank you, Scott, for that. Um, and um, so the, the, the idea is to uh, treat patients with rituximab um, who are uh, at high risk of, uh, have high risk prostate cancer before they have their uh, prostate um, surgery and just see, can we reduce B cells with this antibody in the prostate tissue? That was a very simple um, primary uh, endpoint. And so the design was to give one cycle of rituximab. Uh, Dr. Kane performed the prostatectomy and then we have this tissue for analysis uh, and we've been following PSA and um, B cell, blood counts, et cetera. Uh, and so um, today I'm going to give you the good news that yes, the primary objective of uh, reducing the B cells in the prostates of these patients was achieved. And so um, if we compare the, so we looked, we developed an immunohistochemistry quantitative assay, um, very simple. These are the pathologist marks, so we just quantitate the B cell staining within the tumor region compared to outside. and compared to um, archived historical controls who have um, matched prostate cancer levels. And what we found was that the prostate, um, the B cells in the prostates of, of uh, uh, men who had been treated with rituximab were greatly reduced. And so um, this was a phase zero trial, so uh, now um, the, the next part of this study is really to see, well, since we've removed the B cells from this environment, what does the immune environment in these patients look like? And so what we're doing now, have we, for example, increased the immunological um, you know, environment so that there's more T cell infiltration? Or is there more signs that um, it's an active immune um, environment? And so we're, following, we're doing currently a multiplex study uh, and uh, uh, immunohistochemical studies of T cell markers, CD3, CD4, CD8 macrophages and the immune checkpoints, PD-1 and PD-L1, and uh, Dr. Karen has um, new data of new markers to look at specifically for uh, these um, uh, immune environment changes that um, come about when you remove the potentially immunosuppressive B cells. So, um, so in summary, um, we have used our uh, patient-derived uh, xenograph models, model to um, show that this immunotherapy, this, car this redirecting of activated T cells using a, a bispecific um, molecule, antibody, modified antibody, uh, was successful in uh, finally eradicating the tumors from the bone environment. This is the best thing we've ever tested. Um, and so we're very excited to um, see how quickly it can go into the, cl into the clinic. Um, with the Protex clinical trial, we uh, were able to show that the rituximab does reduce the B cells in the prostate environment. This isn't really the population of patients um, that might benefit from this the most, which would really be patients who um, have been under angiogenic deprivation therapy who are starting to fail, uh, and so if we were able to treat them. But here we can actually tease out more about the mechanism. And then lastly, I had mentioned the prostate Prostvac clinical trial, we, we, it's fully accrued. We've almost uh, collected all the blood um, from um, all the patients pre and post vaccine so we can measure if there's an immune response and really look to see if there's, what are the responding uh, T cell receptors and B cell receptors that we can then engineer for patients. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank the large team of people whose great dedication um, I'm the beneficiary and hopefully the patients are the beneficiary of, and I'd especially like to thank Katrina, who introduced me to Dr. Anna Kalugian, so thank you very much. And uh, also our, our uh, the Leo and Anne Albert Charitable Foundation, um, who've been tremendous support for us. So, thank you. I know you didn't uh, talk about it, but it's mm -hmm. probably worth mentioning the, um, uh, the vaccine, cancer vaccine mm -hmm. yeah. trial that yeah. uh, Kelly Parsons, who's here, mm -hmm. um, conducted. It was a five-site, Hopkins, a few yeah. others, and he was by far the, the top accruer. Mm -hmm. But um, 
it, it was a prevention study, yep. um, but uh, part of its nomenclature or semantics because uh, watchful waiting of real prostate cancer is considered prevention. Um, I guarantee you it's not considered the same for pancreas. So it's, uh, it, it is a little bit of an uh, odd way to look at prevention, but uh, a lot of interest in that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they call it you know, active surveillance, watchful waiting, semantics. Um, but a lot of this, this, this trial accrued so quickly, we did in a year and a half what was slated for four years. So. And be sure mm -hmm. in the acknowledgments to acknowledge Kat and, and, and me for getting the drug. We cornered Sandy Horning. I know, I, 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 I absolutely, yep, yep. I very much thank you. I, yep, yep, I remember. All right. Yeah. Thanks for a great talk. Oh. Um, so if I understood you correctly, you mentioned that you have a different anti-androgen response depending on the PDX site. Mm -hmm. yep. And you had looked at the landscape, I presume, in the bone. So have you followed that up in the subcutaneous tumors and, or look at the expression changes or what could explain the different response? So we have um, done... Uh, most of the genomics and transcriptomics is really focused on comparing the patient bone and our bone xenografts. I would, we have all the tissue ready to go for all the subcutaneous um, tumors that we've treated as well. Um, we're not entirely sure, uh, I mean, we've done some of um, tPCR follow-up of genes that we find that are important. One of the things that I've heard several times um, that I think is actually going to be, you know, are we all just, you know, by default a neuron? But one of the things that happens uh, when we treat with the antiandrogen therapy or some other therapies it's, uh, is that we get this upregulation in the bone of a neuronal signature. So now we're going back to see, did this also happen in the subcutaneous tumors? A little bit more difficult because we didn't capture a lot of them early enough. A lot of the subcutaneous tumors are just gone with the enzalutamide. Um, but, you know, this idea that when the cells have to uh, activate a program to survive, uh, one of the programs they seem to be activating is this neuronal signature as in some kind of escape or um, a survival mechanism. So uh, we're very, very interested in that. Okay. Thank you.